these things, don't be scared. Um, we'll, we'll walk through it and why I was showing these two pictures. So uh, Judy mentioned my father. He actually was a professor in mechanical engineering at IIT. This was actually his, one of his labs, a uh, lab that I worked in for many moons uh, and um, had a lot of fights with him but learned a lot from him uh, and still learn a lot from him. And there you might see, and I, I apologize uh, for the smallness. I'll go back here to see how bad it is. But um, if you can see, there's a lot of red lines bouncing around. That's actually a laser that was set up. And I actually still have the laser. It's a really long one. So if, if you can't see later, I'll say, come on up, and I'll show you. Uh, it was a 5 milliwatt laser. This was like probably in the early 80s picture taken. You could probably tell by the computer. Um, so he really started uh, this whole idea of taking images and using the computer to digitize them and then process them and get information out of them. Okay, and so you can see this is a rather large setup. And so this, again, not very important. This is a disk that's actually being compressed. It's a very standard thing that they do in mechanical engineering to test uh, the properties. And so what you're seeing here is uh, the theoretical and the experimental. And trust me when I say this, they're pretty close because uh, it's a very classic condition. Um, and so this setup, again, was done uh, by some of my uh, father's students. I later did it when I worked for him. And then here I am with one of my students doing something very similar, but at a much smaller scale. So I guess I should say that, that this disc was probably, what, two, three inches in diameter. Um, and here with my student, and I'll show this later, we're looking at something that's five millimeters in diameter and about, uh, I think it was 10 or 15 microns thick. I'll talk about scales later, don't worry about it. Just really small compared to what I'm looking here on the right. And even that stuff in the background there, that was actually in my dad's lab. And I think it's that one right there. I'm not 100% sure. So it's just kind of where I, where I come from and where I am today uh, and, and why I'm passionate about what we'll be talking about today. All right. So I'm going to start with the good stuff because that really gets people going, right? And that was what was advertised. So I'd hate to not deliver as advertised. So uh, how do self-driving uh, self cars work? I wanted to figure that out as well. So I did a little bit of research, and, and really it does come down to optics of some sorts. You've got uh, your LIDAR, so this is a light detecting, so kind of like radar, but using light waves. Uh, you've got the cameras, you've got other uh, laser sensors, you've got a nice computer here, and it's basically giving information on position. It connects with the GPS, and maybe you've seen videos, but I'll uh, see if I can do this. Probably not, can I? Yeah, that's what I get for messing with technology here. <laughs> oh, here we go, good. Hopefully that'll work. I'm not sure where it'll work, but... All right. They just recently installed like literally three screens on my um, computer or attached to my laptop and I think that's what it's trying to do right now. So hopefully we'll see this, but if not, we'll just move on. Can I figure this out though? That's a question. Somewhere here maybe. What keeps the 82,000 oh. students at one of the most it's not a Whoa, that was a little too much. That was NIU, by the way. Okay. Yeah. Oh, here we go. That's what I wanted.
right. That's better than nothing. Oh, God. Just made a mess of this. Should have fixed that first. I don't want to extend these to plays. Can I duplicate them? Sorry about that. Hopefully this still works somehow. No. All right. I'm just going to keep it that way. No. All right, I learned my lesson. I'm sorry. Keep it here. Make it simple. And I'm not going to do that, OK? Let me see that, OK. Good. All right. OK, why is this not playing? Definitely not going to do that. This is just a bad thing altogether, huh? Okay. We'll give up on that for now. Where did it go? Terrible, terrible, terrible. Why is this doing this? I don't want to do this. Show the video. All right, so sorry, I, I really apologize about. You're just going to have to rely on, on my valuable word and not see the video it's there because it's all on the iPad. And you can even set it on your phone. You can set it down, and it'll still walk you through all those steps. OK? Um, same thing like with your phone, just like with the Pokemon Go, you might hit certain locations. Again, 
through GPS and then um, image recognition. It'll say, oh yeah, there's a coffee shop in there, there's a cleaners. It gives you other augmented information, uh, maybe people that are having sales or whatever it is. So there's also a great way for advertising or, or attracting people to, to your locations. And then the other cool aspect is um, for other, uh, like Ikea's and other um, companies, where let's say you have a table, you're like, man, I would really like to put a lamp or something on that table. So you pass your phone over again and you can select from different objects and again, it'll display it so it looks like it's on your table, but it's on your phone, you're looking at it and you can change the color, you can change the shape and see, see what would look nice there, right? So that's kind of cool. Um, the other aspect of augmented reality, and this would have been a great video to show, so maybe at the end I'll try to get it running without the, the PowerPoint. Um, there's this company that now has this heads-up display where you can literally interact with the 3D space. So it's, it's, these are um, lenses that project uh, ho uh, holograms, essentially, so you see the physical object through the lenses, but there's really obviously nothing there but you can grab it and manipulate it and move it and stretch it and so it's, it's actually really cool. Um, and so they're looking at creating applications. So here's just an, uh, what an image of that would look like as a person's looking. It's also tracking where your hand is. So again, that's how it knows where you're interacting. So again, you can pick up a ball and bounce it or, or move it or pick something up. Um, and so there's a lot of ideas, and I'll share some of mine, in terms of how this technology, again, can be used for the medical industry, for uh, other areas, and so it, it's a very exciting time. And I think right now, you can probably get one of these for about $1,000. So if anyone wants to donate $1,000 to me, I'd love to share the experience with you. Um, all right. So let's get into some of the nitty gritty. I, I won't go into a ton of detail, but <clears throat> so as I said, the image recognition or any of those uh, uh, aspects has to do with some sort of scanning and or variant. So essentially what you will do is you'll have um, in some cases one camera. Uh, so like in this case, and that's a lot of what we do in our research, uh, you've got a laser that presents, uh, projects some light. It's a structured light. You know the distance between the object and what you're looking at. And then when that bounces back, again, at a known distance, that information gets lodged into a pixel, like your camera that has pixels. And so for each pixel you have that information, you can get distance or whatever it is you're looking at. Okay. The same thing or similar thing is if I have a camera and multiple angles, I know its position, I know the camera's positions relative to each other, so I can start to triangulate geometry, right? Uh, we should all know that more or less, right? And then we can get positions and distances and things like that. So I can do that um, also with multiple cameras. Where is that uh, at in, in the space and know where these positions are and, and things of that nature. And so that's the essence of how these scanners or things like these um, triangulation, so for the cars, how they triangulate things uh, to get information. Uh, you probably maybe have seen this one famous guy who got, uh, was the first one to get scanned and 3D printed bust. Um, came out very lifelike. I don't know if he was happy about that or not, but at least it's there. Uh, so this is one example of how that works. Uh, so you can take a lot of cameras and get uh, various perspectives, put that light interference back together. So that's the digital model and then you can send it to say like a 3D printer and print it up. Um, so the other one that, that, that I was doing, uh, or that I've done and I had the fortunate uh, pleasure of working with my dad, and I say that now in retrospect, um, because he, he is uh, such an intelligent man and I learned so much from him aside from all the, the, the technology but just how to be a compassionate individual. Anyways, um, in this case what you're doing now is you're projecting a series of structured lights, so lines. And why that's important, again, because the lines have a certain pitch and a certain distance. You know that distance that you're projecting, you got your cameras, you can now start getting information about the surface. Geometry, you can also, if it bends, you know how much it bends, you can start getting things like stress and strain, which are very important in engineering aspects. So what we can do and what we did and what I'm gonna show you is we then tested 
things without having to break them, to understand their limits, to understand how they work. Um, and that's very valuable in certain industries. So some of the industries that, that Judy mentioned, the Air Force, Caterpillar, when you're trying to study something that, that you only have one of or is very valuable and you don't want to break. So I'm going to go through some examples of that and, and then um, carry on from there. So in this case, we're looking at a panel. We're bending the panel. Again, this was more just like a, a traditional study to see how this structured light would work in terms of comparing it to uh, finite element modeling and other traditional methodologies. So this is a, like a five foot by two and a half foot panel, so rather large. And you know, um, you'll just have to believe me, there's not a whole lot of ways to know how this thing deflects in real life. So you can take some indicators, dial indicators, and measure them like hand by hand, and it's, you know, possible, but it takes a long time and it's very cumbersome. So what we did is we projected some lights before we load it and then after we load it, and then we subtract those two images, and then this image gives us the actual deformed shape of what that panel would look like or what it looks like. So that's what you see up here, the structured light pattern. We just put it in a color coded. And then this is what you would get from the computer. So just as a comput uh, computer, uh, as a student, you would build a same model. You would say here are the loading conditions because it's a very simple loading case. And so you can see it uh, agrees rather well with that. And so all I'm showing here now is this is what we measured. And so we measured the deformation. Strain just means deformation. So it basically along that uh, axis, so in the five foot length, it deflected about 200 microns, which I think is a, about the diameter of a human hair. Okay, so that's what the type of deflection we can measure over five feet. Okay, and so, and then it's showing you that the finite model, so what the computer came up with was actually almost the same. And as I was
So just to say that this is another quick, uh, inexpensive way of doing things. We then did this in a recent project, and I talked a little bit about this in my 3D printing uh, discussion with metal. Uh, same thing with metal, you want to be able to measure the dimensions, and so we're just showing here different states so that we could measure it. The other nice thing is then we can get the actual geometry, so if there are other problems that are going on, we can detect them as they're building. So this is something that can happen real time. And just showing the difference between, again, what we measure with a traditional caliper and the accuracy you can get with actually using the, the light structured light method. Um, okay, so then we talk about, and this is kind of going into outer space, but we'll be okay, uh, doing measurements down at the um, um, nanometer level. Um, there were some discoveries that uh, my father made um, in, again, early 2000s that, that I were, uh, he and I were doing work on. And to make a long story short, um, uh, there's something called the Rayleigh wave light criteria. So beyond a certain wavelength, you, visible light, you can't, can't see it. So you can't take a conventional microscope, for example, and see something that's 20 nanometers in size. Okay, but we are. So what's happening, I'll give you the, the nickel version, is that so those little nanoparticles are in that water. We then put a laser and it reflects and it creates this evanescent field. So it actually excites the particle and the particle lights itself up. And the light from the particle then travels and that's what we measure and record. Yeah, exactly. So basically, we take, a, again, like a $10,000 microscope and we do measurements that would require like a TEM, which is, again, on the order of a million, two million dollars. Okay, and so again, you don't need to know all the details, but just to know that we did those measurements um, and we published quite a few papers. So again, through our software, we're able to get 3D, 2D images so you can take that information and do a lot of things with it. Um, this was a part of that work that I was telling you at the very beginning with my student. So this was work done at Northern um, where we were taking these um, perylene uh, thin, um, so this is actually 60 microns, um, and again, as I said, human hair is 200 microns, so more than or le half of that. Um, these sculpted thin films are going to be are trying to be used in the biomedical applications for implants and for so, for other other items. So, but the important thing is they don't know what the mechanical properties are because you imagine something that's 60 microns thick. How do you test its strength? Right? So what we did is we pressurize it with air, and so as it inflates, we measure the deflection of it. And with the deflection, then you can get strain and stress and all this stuff. So that's how we did it. This is what it looks like. And then there's that um, curve. So the curve here is just showing theoretically what it should look like and what we measured optically. Again, you'll just have to trust me that it, it's very good uh, measurement. Um, and so my student was able to publish. That's kind of why I'm showing. We had a lot of publications, but I was proud of this one, second or third student of mine that ended up getting a really prestigious publication out of work that we did here in, at Northern. Um, then there was some work uh, also done at Northern, and I talked a little bit about this last time as well, I think. This is where we're machining ceramics. And why we want to machine ceramics, again, uh, you can make a lot of components that can resist higher temperatures. So uh, um, if you're looking at engines and you want to have better efficiencies, there's all these push to make higher efficient cars. Well, one way potentially is ceramics. But ceramics, unfortunately, are very expensive to manufacture. So we came up again with a way to machine these. But the importance is when you're machining, you don't have a very good surface finish. So you want to make sure you do. So we used this technique to measure the surface roughness. Okay, so again, same thing, structured light. This is now the surface of the ceramic. And again, not all the details are important, but just to show as we get a better surface finish, which we do with the, with the laser, we get better properties and better repeatability of the surface as composed to what they would do, which is diamond grinding. So that was very important. So this is just showing a conventional system, again, this is probably on the order of fifty to $100,000 piece of equipment uh, to get this kind of a scan. 
same thing. This was our software, again, uh, at a fraction of the cost with this setup we had on a microscope, getting the same results, uh, showing the same results. So kind of putting this all together, and you didn't see the video, but I promise if she allows me after this two more slides, I'll show the video. You have some data of, uh, and this was provided by Rolls-Royce, we have a critical blade that you need to repair, right? But, you know, your experts stuck in, you know, you name it, uh, South Africa, doing some other project, and he needs to analyze the data. So you have him put up his heads, heads up display, and then he can start seeing the differences between the model and what you actually just measured, and he can take it and he can analyze it virtually and say, oh, I see a problem here, or look at that point, maybe change the design here. He can then get on his computer, do those, send those back to you wherever you are, and, and, and create those um, uh, changes all virtually and in space. Um, the other thing is, um, because I was talking about nanoparticles, uh, there has been a lot of work. This was a talk that Dr. Adam Wax gave some time ago on using nanoparticles to identify tumors, the same concept, so we could then again take that information and now localize that, um, those tumors, understand what kind of procedures need to be done based on the stresses and the structures, and, and so really kind of thinking forward, thinking on that one, but I think there's possibilities there. So um, I apologize for all those technical difficulties. Hopefully you enjoyed, and as I said, if I have permission, I'll try to at least dig up the one video so you can see it, because it's really cool. If not, I'll just tell you to, where to find it. Thank you very much, and it's been a pleasure. <laughs>